Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week, Central Texas Gardener checks out WaterWise plans for sustainable gardens with Lauren and Scott Ogden. On tour, visit a no-lawn garden that's gone to the birds, butterflies, and bees. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com. What happens when you replace lawn with native plants for wildlife? Find out why Ann Bellamy took the innovative path. No matter the season or time of day, Ann Bellamy can spot something new in her garden every hour. The habitat she created for herself and the wildlife is far more enriching than the yard that came with the house. The front yard was a regular lawn with um, pecan trees and boxwood and nandina, uh, a few shrubs. Um, the backyard was pretty much dead grass and um, one sad little area with some dying perennials, but that was it. It was pretty much um, hot and dead. I wanted to walk outdoors and be surprised. Um, and this garden is different, tremendously different seasonally very different day to day, and even from morning to afternoon, because it's not just the plants, it's also the animals. And so by life, I wanted the insects, I wanted the butterflies, the birds. When I started in the back and I had this small area, I was so delighted by it that that's how come things kept getting to be more and more, and I eventually had the courage to decide I was going to work on the front yard. <laughs> but at first I started with the back, I thought, nobody's going to see this, and I can try different things and learn. And I would have taken lots of different kinds of training, which I very much appreciate. Habitat steward training was the first, and um, that's through the City of Austin National Wildlife Federation and also Travis Audubon. And that was excellent training, and now I give talks to that group. And then I took Master Naturalist, um, Capillary and Master Naturalist training. I took um, Master Gardener training. I took classes at Go Native U um, at the Wildflower Center. And I'm continually learning. One thing she learned was how to deal with her red death soil. It took practice. Now I sort of know what to do. And I, I put some decomposed granite, I put some compost, I put a little bit of manure, I mix it all up with the, with the clay. And slowly the clay is, it's becoming more alive, more permeable. Designer Kathy Northrum designed the front yard paths and suggested plant layout. She also suggested berms for the backyard. And then I just like an undulating surface. It's just prettier and also it allows, again, bringing in some soil that's got better drainage. The combination of berms and improved soil allowed her to diversify for perpetual wildlife food and habitat. I started small with my planting, and then things moved and I tried something over here and tried something over there. It evolved over time and actually what happened was, I mean, I knew that I needed certain paths just to get in and out of the house and through the gate and things like that, and those were wider paths. But then the rest of them, um, as plants grew, they took over the wider paths and the paths got narrower. Eventually, she worked with designer Scott Thurman to widen and clarify navigation with stone paths. Scott added more berms and extended Anne's first one, giving it some bold performers for vertical counterpoint. The front yard was a slightly different challenge. Again, there's sort of sunshade. Kathy Nordstrom tackled the issues, towering pecan trees and dry shade. One thing I did was um, also open up the pecan trees a little bit 
to allow in a little more sun so they're not it wasn't dense dense shade and that's actually an ideal situation is to have sort of filtered sunlight to provide nectar food and found the flowering perennials that perform in that niche and contrast floppy shapes with structural ones. In front, she wanted more formal paths. Without sacrificing clear-cut direction, she evokes a mood to wander, not barrel through. I think just everything done in, with curves works better. And that includes the sidewalks, and um, just everything is, is just more gentle and, and um, has more interest. Strategically placed garden art accents each journey. I grew up in Panama, and um, so you'll notice that the garden has a little bit of a Latin influence in, uh, in some, partly in the plants, there are some Mexican plants, and then partly in the artwork. Plus, a lot of the artwork you'll notice are animals, so it fits in with the theme of habitat. To ensure wildlife food, and installed drip irrigation on a timer to water her normally drought-hardy plants once a week when rainfall eludes the garden in extreme heat. Water management included flooding on her downhill site. With French drains, dry creek beds, and gutters, she keeps water in the garden and not under the house. On one demon flooding slope, Kathy Nordstrom suggested plants for a rain garden. The rain garden is an area that only gets wet during a rain. So the plants there have to be able to sit in water during a rain, you know, after a rain event, but then they, it also dries up. So they have to be able to handle both. Designing a garden that connects with nature is not just a makeover in style, it's one of philosophy. Well, it's food, water, and shelter for um, all the creatures of Central Texas or the ones that are migrating through. Lots of migrants come through, whether it's insects or birds. And, um, and that's, to me, a lot of the life in the garden isn't, isn't just the plants. It's all these other creatures. And I think that we all want to do our small, small things that we can do to make the planet a better place. And I think it, I guess my passion is to create habitat. I want a living garden. Now, that means you have to be tolerant of change, lots of change, and things don't always bloom when you want them to. Things look, things go dormant, um, but it's not a sterile garden and it's full of surprises. And it's hospitable and, um, you know, I feel the pain of so much urbanization is taking away um, habitat. This is a very tiny oasis, but hopefully other people will do it as well. And, um, we can make a difference. The wonderful opportunity with the garden is you can be original. And I think that would be very exciting. This is partly what people are afraid of, is to show their originality. Um, and so you can do sort of the standard palette of evergreen shrubs and lawn and two trees in the front yard and you're done. Uh, it's not very original, but it's you look like everybody else. and. Um, and so it's not too scary. It's a little scarier to be original, but I welcome people to, if their interest is herbs, do herbs, or if their interest is vegetable gardening, do vegetable gardening, or if their interest are native plants, there may be certain plants they prefer, um, but to go ahead and express themselves. Thanks for sharing your garden with us. I love to see those garden conversions work out so happily. Right now we're joined by two of our favorite guests here at Central Texas Gardener, Laura Springer Ogden and Scott Ogden. Uh, welcome back to Central Texas Gardener. It's always a pleasure to see you. Great to be here, Tom. Thanks. Well, every time I see you, we come. it seems like we're celebrating a new book that you all have produced. And we, here we are again, the new book this time, Water Wise Plants for Sustainable Gardens. And boy, this is timely. <laughs> well, I, it seems to be, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was wetter when we started writing it, but uh, it's mm -hmm. been dry the last couple seasons for mm. us here so uh, dry is an understatement Scott and uh, uh, but this book is very different from previous ones and that this is 
when I first looked at it, I said, boy, this looks like a, a field guide for visiting the nursery. <laughs> well, yeah, after our previous books, which were kind of big tomes that you had to sit down and read, read your way through, we decided it was time to do a project that was a little bit easier for us to handle and, you know, mm -hmm. and, more, and maybe uh, for a more general audience. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, really just a, a quick list of 200 of our favorite plants that uh, are water-wise and um, also generally adaptable to garden use. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll, they'll take, they'll survive uh, the, the uh, actual uh, rough and tumble of garden life. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, those then we've uh, organized into categories mm -hmm. that should make them uh, easy for people to understand how they'll work in the, the landscape. Um, those, and the, each of those categories is color coded in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and then each plant just gets a, a, a quick um, entry describing how to use it, what it needs, what it does, and then uh, listing some of its uh, near relations and friends uh, that, that might work out. So in addition to those 200, um, there's another 400 plants that we mentioned. Okay. And more than half of the, of the plants in there are gonna be appropriate for people in, in, in Austin. Yeah, well, there, I, I, a quick uh, just glance at the books, I saw lots of old friends and lots of intriguing plants as well that I was very interested in. And uh, you, Scott was using the phrase rough and tumble, and it has been a rough and tumble time, and I think people are really hungry for this kind of plant information. Yeah, what we'd like to talk about especially is not only water-wise plants, but plants that can take the double spanking that we've had just <laughs> recently with this really, really cold winter or actually two very cold winters in a row, and then the horrible drought and mm -hmm. extreme heat. Mm -hmm. So, and there are actually quite a few plants in there, in that book, that mm -hmm. can take the double spanking. Well, I think a lot of gardeners feel double spanked, and so they probably <laughs> sympathize or empathize with the plants out there in the garden. Uh, and there are lots of good ones here. So why don't we dive in and, and talk about some of the different species that you want to highlight. And mm -hmm. I love talking to you too because you're so into the plants. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wanted to get to this in a hurry. The, uh, the first one on our list is Euphorbia rigida. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is, I think, a really striking uh, plant. Yeah, we, we call, uh, call it silver spurge in the, mm -hmm. in the book. It has some other common names besides that. But uh, for us, it's been you know, really one of the, the most resilient. It's, it's really a perennial, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a perennial that's almost succulent. It's got that kind of uh, yeah. architectural mm -hmm. character. And so, th so many perennials in the Texas climate get floppy and fall apart. And this is a plant that actually doesn't do that. It stays tidy and nice looking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's evergreen. And then very early in the spring, late winter, you get these beautiful yellow uh, cymes uh, on the tips of the, of the branches. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, just this beautiful uh, silvery and very architectural mat. What, what's the, what are the right growing conditions for this one, Lauren? Um, Basically, it'll grow almost anywhere, but it really would like good drainage. So mm -hmm. not in the, the lowest part of your garden. I right. Ideally with so, full sun, if you can get and, it that. Um, it can take some dry shade. It won't bloom as well. Mm -hmm. But what I think special about the plant is there isn't a single mammal that wants to eat it. <laughs> so for those so, in deer country, take mm -hmm. note. So, yeah, right, right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good advice. And uh, again, an a plant with uh, strong bones, uh, great color and a strong addition to any landscape, yeah. I would think. And, it, and it's a, it is a Mediterranean plant, mm -hmm. so like most of those plants, it follows a, a cool season growth cycle. It mm -hmm. actually grows a, quite a bit during the winter time. Okay, so, good, yeah. good. Uh, I love the Dianes. I love uh, this plant family, and there are a lot of cool ones that have come in from Mexico in the past few mm -hmm. years. Dione angustifolium. Yeah, that, that used to be listed as a variety of the common Dione edulee, but mm -hmm. this is the northernmost form of it. It's the one that grows closest to the Texas border, mm -hmm. uh, right in northern Mexico. And it grows on limestone hills, uh, very similar to mm -hmm. what we have here in Austin. Um, it grows perfectly happily in full shade. It also grows very well here in full sun. Yeah. Um, and even with the cold weather we've had the last couple winters, not even a bit of foliage damage. The on only these. one in our garden in Austin that I mean, did not have foliage so, damage. So I mean, it's, it's hard. All the sagos all were the bare. All the and oh. other dunes also mm -hmm. had some damage, right. but mm -hmm. that one was just clean yeah. as a whistle. So it's as hardy a cycad as you can grow here, and it's very, very drought tolerant. Is it one of the bluish ones? Um, 
it's it's more of an olive green okay. most of the time, but it sometimes has a, a pinkish blue color when it first leafs out. Oh, that sounds yeah. lovely. Yeah. The new yeah. foliage is beautiful. And and it, uh, such a striking form on these plants. And I, I you know I like the the, the, the dianes maybe a little sparer looking than the sagos, not as dense. Yes, that's and true. I, and I think that that shows up better for some reason in the garden. I like that texture. But they're also a lot. not quite as stiff, mm -hmm. so they actually have more of a fern-like quality. Yeah. So they look more like a fern that doesn't need moisture. Well, so. and that's a good way of thinking, and that's right. probably why I'm more attracted to but, love the ferns. Yeah, yeah. But, but don't get too close, because they are a little prickly, <laughs> and, and again, that's they're well defended from browsing mammals right. for that reason. I also, in addition to loving the dianes, I'm crazy about iris, and you're, you have one on the list here that I'm not fam really uh, familiar with, is iris ziphium. Yeah, it's the, the old-fashioned Spanish iris. Mm -hmm. um, that that's uh, very close to the the uh, Dutch irises mm -hmm. that that you know, people are still you know maybe know a little mm -hmm. bit better. So it's a little bulb, not a rhizome. It's a bulb, and mm -hmm. um, what I like about it, especially because most bulbs, their foliage is really. If you're lucky, passable. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. <laughs> and it has very narrow and often kind of silvery foliage. Mm. So it's, it's quite attractive. And, and it's narrow enough that when it starts to go down, it doesn't make a big mess. Right. And the flowers, as most iris, are to die for. They're mm. beautiful. Yeah. So. Well, certainly a beautiful color from what I've seen. Uh, so th that's a great addition. And, uh, and you... A lot of the, those irises do tend to be a little silvery, but one that's got more striking silver form, I think, would be terrific. And the mm -hmm. flowers are not always also that deep blue. There are other colors. So oh, that's cool. the nice thing, too. They're yellows and whites. So. Great, great. The, uh, we all love the Zephyranthes or the rain lilies, <laughs> and these are great plants. They are, and our, our native one is actually one of the finest. Um, it actually has very attractive grayish foliage, and it's up most of the year. So um, if you're looking for a, you know, a companion, if you have a cactus garden, one mm -hmm. of the issues with cactus is to have something besides cactus so it doesn't look like a collection <laughs> of ping pong balls. Right. And rain lilies actually make a great companion because yeah. they can nest in among those. And when you have a, a thunderstorm in the early spring or and on into the summer, they'll pop up and bloom. The, the one we're we feature in the in, in our in the book is uh, the native Zephyranthes drummondii. Mm -hmm. um, also, a lot of people call it Cuperia, right. but that's one that uh, blooms mostly in the first half of the summer, unless we have mm -hmm. a year like last year where there's no rain in the first half of the summer, <laughs> yeah. and then it, then it'll be blooming in the fall because mm -hmm. it'll bloom whenever the first rains hit it. Yeah, and I always used to go collect the seed after they draw and just scatter them in my crushed yeah. granite, and they, yeah. they come up everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, they will do that. I yeah. love rain lilies because they're basically a plant I didn't know anything about till a decade ago, mm -hmm. and so they're still kind of magical to me. But mm -hmm. in terms of being really the ones that are the, are some of the very most drought tolerant, I mean, this one and the biggest flowers, the Drummondia yeah. has huge flowers they're and they're beautiful. fragrant. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the other rain lilies aren't fragrant. Well, and as Scott said, the perfect accompaniment to cacti or agaves, yuccas, things mm -hmm. like that. For all those who, uh, who, you know, want some softness in those beds, this is the perfect plant. Well, and Tom, you were saying, you know, all these architectural plants, we do them so well here, but they, after a while, start to look like furniture because they don't change a lot over the year. And so having, <laughs> true. having bulbs come and go gives mm -hmm. you some spontaneity in the garden. That's great. Now, uh, Lady Banksy Rose is one that's on your list. And we, just real briefly, if you'll touch on this one. Well, yeah, if you, most people don't think, wouldn't think of a rose as being a drought-tolerant plant, but actually the, the largest Lady Banksy rose in North America is in Tombstone, Arizona. It covers a square mile. <laughs> and it, it's actually... I've I mean, seen pictures of it. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a crazy thing. But, <laughs> but actually, this is a very, very tough plant and um, could be grown well as a freestanding shrub um, mm. or trained up. It, it wants a substantial support. Good evergreen foliage, and in the sp in the springtime, loaded up with incredible beautiful flowers. So right, well, couldn't ask for a nicer plant. Well, that one in Tombstone certainly has a well shaded root zone. I would imagine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Well, as always, it's a real pleasure. If people want to learn more about the new book, Water Wise Plants for Sustainable Gardens, they go to the Timber Press website. Mm -hmm. They can also go to Amazon.com and uh, look inside if they want to do that there. And of course, you have your own website, right? Yeah, PlantDrivenDesign.com. All right. Well, thank you both very much for being our guests. It's always a pleasure. Coming up next, it's Deaf. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is CTG's resident doggy horticulturist, Augie. Our question of the week comes from Jill. Her 12-year-old oak trees have roots above ground, and she wants to enclose the trees in a planting bed with a ground cover. 
Can she cover the roots with compost? And how much should she use? Since exposed tree roots are pretty common, I imagine many people may have this question. Those exposed roots can actually be a hazard, so if you can cover them, you definitely should. And if the tree is in the middle of the lawn, the roots are also in the way of the mower and can get nicked, which wouldn't be good. Building up the soil over those roots and planting a ground cover, one that doesn't need to be mowed, is a great idea. Just make sure that the soil, compost, or mulch that you add doesn't touch the trunk and that you don't apply too thick. Two to four inches is a good amount, but don't apply more than that. You don't want to cover those roots too deeply. I'm sure you've noticed how barky the exposed roots are. Although they once took up water and nutrients for the tree, now they serve as support and are connected to the feeding roots, which are found at the drip line of the tree, out past the furthest branches. If you do plant a ground cover over the exposed roots, be careful not to damage the roots if you ever choose to dig around in that soil. A wounded spot will allow for the invasion of fungi and bacteria that could damage your tree. And a large cut might result in dieback in the part of the tree connected to the cut root. Our pick of the week is Texas mountain laurel, Sephora secundiflora. This native shrub, small tree, is an evergreen that's extremely drought tolerant and tough. Even though rain was sparse the past two years, they survived without too much trouble and recently put on quite a show this year after our surprisingly wet winter. Mountain laurel is a slow grower, but well worth the wait. At maturity, it will be 10 to 20 feet tall and 8 to 12 feet wide, so give it plenty of room. Since it grows so slowly, it may look lonely in such a large space until it gets big enough to fill it. Resist the urge to plant any other shrubs or large plants around it, but planting a ground cover would be fine. Mountain laurel will bloom better if planted in full sun, but also does fine in part shade. It adapts to most soil types, but prefers rocky limestone and needs very good drainage. People often ask us why they don't bloom. Maturity is one reason. And perhaps also pruning off new flower spikes, which are brown and not too attractive, leading some people to get rid of them not fully knowing what they are. Also, Texas mountain laurel can be attacked by the Genista caterpillar. In one day, they can defoliate a small tree, so be sure to apply Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, at the first outbreak. Another great reason to choose this plant, it's deer resistant. The seeds are poisonous if swallowed, but not dangerous otherwise. Once fully mature, the seed pods turn dark brown or gray, and the seeds inside are dark red. The seeds have a very heavy seed coat, making them hard to germinate. But if you wish to try, it's best to harvest the seed pods before they're fully developed and plant the seeds before they've turned red. To do this week, plant annual flower seeds like sunflowers, zinnias, cosmos, celosia, and globe amaranth. You can also plant gourds, eggplant, peppers, summer squash, and sweet potato slips. And I'd also like to remind you about the free horticulture seminars that the Texas AgriLife Extension Service and Master Gardeners do here in Austin almost every weekend in the spring. We love to see you at one of those. We cover everything from vegetables to flowers to firewise landscaping. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your pictures or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Meredith Giles for Backyard Basics. Howdy, y'all. Meredith Giles here with Backyard Basics. As Scott and Lauren said, 2011 was a double spanking year for the plants. February of 2011 saw the worst freeze in 35 years, and all of 2011 was a terrible drought. So what plants made it through these, both of these things, without any issues? Now here's my situation. I'm in East Austin, just east of I-35, and I stopped watering in April of last year because I knew it was gonna be a bad drought and I didn't wanna be out there all the time. So here's a few of the ones that did well for me. Nearly all of my shade trees made it just fine. They did look like they were suffering, but they seem to have pulled through. Now that we've gotten some moisture, they look great. Some smaller trees that did great, the Weesatch tree, uh, one of the native acacias, it did great. Another one that you don't see nearly as often, an olive tree, um, Olea europea. Mostly fruitless varieties are what you're gonna find in the nurseries, but there are fruiting ones available. Also, the Arizona cypress, a beautiful evergreen. The Texas smoke tree is another one that really performed well. And finally, the Mexican Buckeye. Now moving down to some smaller shrub type stuff, we have some old favorites like the Texas Sage. Another one you don't see nearly as often, the compact strawberry tree, a relative of our native madrone, but much easier to find and much easier to, to get in the ground and take care of. 
Chaparral Sage, Salvia Clevelandii, and also the Jerusalem Sage. This is one that I thought for sure would freeze down and for sure would not make it through the drought. Survived both of them with no problem. Moving on to some smaller plants, most all of the agaves, yuccas, and their relatives did fine. Now you do want to make sure and check hardiness zones. Some of the agaves you'll find in nurseries are zone 9 and they may have struggled with the cold. Most of the yuccas, hesperalos, dazzlerians did fine. Another one I really love has been the globe mallow. This plant has done wonderfully in my yard. It was actually planted in March of last year and like I said, I stopped watering in April. It's performed wonderfully. The blackfoot daisy. This is one you see growing native all through the hill country. Does well with no irrigation at all. Right next to it, a lot of times, you'll see the four nerve daisy, another great little perennial plant that does awesome in our Austin climate. A great way to replace your lawn would be with a plant like Texas sedge, a native small grass that you can mow, you can walk on, and performs really well even in the cold and the drought. So these are some plants that did really well for me in that double spanking year that was 2011. This is Meredith Giles with Backyard Basics. Visit klru.org slash ctg to find out more and watch online. Next week, meet Susan Orlean, author of The Orchid Thief. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com.